Hey guys, welcome back to A Different Atheist Reads, A History of God by Karen Armstrong, Christy here. We are now into chapter one, but in order to tackle chapter one, we really have to get a bit of a roadmap. It's a big chapter. It starts on page nine in my Kindle edition and then moves on to page 50, which is a lot of content. So I've broken the chapter up into pieces and I wanna tell you how they are going to fit together so that it makes a bit more sense. As I complained, Karen doesn't really have uh, a tendency to tell her readers where she's going. And so you end up kind of following along and hoping that she connects pieces of information for you. I want to do a bit more than that. I want to be a bit more proactive. So I'm going to explain how I've broken up the chapters and why. Karen has an introduction in chapter one where she pretty much lays out the themes that I see her presenting throughout the book, namely her mythology of the history of her God rather than the factual depiction of God through textual evidence. And so she starts off with um, some ideas and makes uh, comments about the way in which modern people don't connect to myths and spiritual things the way people used to in the past. And then to examine why it is that we've lost something, she wants to go back and, and look at these older myths and historical presentations of God and track them. So that's what the chapter ends up being about. And she moves from basically the pe time period from Mesopotamia all the way through, I think, until the like sort of Greek philosophy. So there's a, there's a tremendous amount of time that she's covering in the first chapter, even with, say, 40 pages of text. But I think it's important that we break this up. So there's the introduction, the Mesopotamian background. She also then gives information about the Canaanite religion and some of its major players, because the names of those gods will be appearing in the, in the texts that come up for the Torah. Then she moves into the Bible, where she discusses um, Abraham and, and on onwards. And then she does a section on Hinduism and Buddhism. I'm just gonna skip that. In fact, whenever there's a section on Hinduism and Buddhism in A History of God, I'm just gonna chuck it out. And there's a couple reasons why. One is, I only have so much time in my life <laughs> to do all this stuff. And although I am pretty familiar with, with Buddhism, uh, Hinduism isn't an, an expertise of mine. And the book is called A History of God, not sort of a history of the Hindu gods and Buddhism and monotheism. So she really uses Hinduism and Buddhism, I think, as merely ways to contrast monotheism, so in the ways that con maybe monotheism is slightly deficient, he, she might do a, a counterfactual with how Hindus approach this or how Buddhists approach this. And while it's perhaps interesting for people who are interested in comparative religions, in terms of the history of God, which is the main thesis of her book, I don't necessarily think it augments it that much to the point where we couldn't do the book without it. So. Basically, if you're interested in that aspect of her presentation and how she makes these things connect, then you can read the book and enjoy that part of it. But for the series, I'm just going to skip it for time and also just for relevance. Then, as I said, the last section is going to be on the Greeks and Greek philosophy and uh, kind of starting to put together abstract notions that become important as the Bible matures, as shall we say, as a text, as other ideas from other philosophies start to enter into it and, and shape the presentation from what we see in the polytheistic, very personal gods, all the way up to the notion of logos, which is, of course, a Greek idea. So that's the general arc of chapter one. It's a lot to get through. So as I said, I'm going to break it up. In this video, I'm going to discuss the introduction and things about Mesopotamia and uh, the Canaanite religion. This will then set us up for a discussion of the Bible in the next video. And the other thing I want to do in this video is, of course, apply the concepts or the attributes that we had in our concepts video to look at the way in which ancient people understood their gods and the interactions with gods so that we have, again, this baseline that we can use as we move forward. Karen starts by introducing the ideas of a, a priest, I assume, by his title, Father Wilhelm Schmidt, in about 1912, who had an idea that perhaps there had been a primitive form of monotheism that existed, and then people began to worship a lot of different gods um, afterwards. And then, if this is the case, Armstrong writes, 
If this is so, then monotheism was one of the earliest ideas evolved by human beings to explain the mystery and tragedy of life. The problem with her calling this a theory is that she says in a couple lines almost immediately after this about Schmidt's theory that it is almost impossible to prove this one way or the other, this idea of monotheism preceding polytheism. There have been many theories about the origin of religion, yet it seems that creating gods is something that human beings have always done. When one religious idea ceases to work for them, it is simply replaced. The problem I have with this is if something cannot be demonstrated one way or the other, then it's not really a theory. And I will pick up on this more in my critique video, which I think is going to be more ranting, but I don't know how to get away from it, so I'm going to have to rant a little bit. It might just be I'm ranting every time I react, but um, in, this, uh, in this introduction, she then moves on to discuss this concept of the numinous and these emotions that people had and that um, in the past people were more connected with their myths to a spiritual sense of the divine whereas today uh, she sees science in a replacing or interfering or disconnecting. It's, it's quite unclear to me what her actual position is, but she sees a modern problem that we face is our disconnection with the myths that so much of human history have cons has consisted of. And if I might, I'm just going to read a, a little bit. One of the reasons religion seems irrelevant today is that many of us no longer have a sense that we are surrounded by the unseen. Our scientific culture educates us to focus our attention on the physical and the material world in front of us. This method of looking at the world has achieved great results. One of its consequences, however, is that we have, as it were, edited out the sense of the spiritual or the holy which pervades the lives of people in more traditional societies at every level and which once was an essential component of our human experience of the world. If we are losing things as a society, Karen has to be a bit more clear about what it is she thinks we are losing. And she does point to that in the first chapter. She says, to understand what we are losing, if, that is, he really is disappearing, we need to see what people were doing when they began to worship this god, what he meant, and how he was conceived. To do that, we need to go back to the ancient world of the Middle East, where the idea of our God gradually emerged about 14,000 years ago. Here she's transitioning from this speculation that maybe there was monotheism before polytheism and then there was monotheism again, and the idea that people uh, in the past had a different perception of reality, whereas our modern world is clouded or influenced, let's say, influenced by our scientific approach. And these are, I guess, the things that she wants to set up in order to contrast uh, ancient people and their beliefs. In the next section of the book, what she does is discuss what she thinks we're missing, I think, is probably the best way to take this forward. And that is, she cites Rudolf Otto's notion of like the numinous, which, and I think it might just be better to quote, I'm not entirely sure what the numinous is, so I'll just defer to uh, definition here. It can be any desire to explain the origins of the world or find a basis for ethical behavior. Sometimes it inspired wild bacchanalian excitement, sometimes deep calm, sometimes dread, sometimes awe, sometimes humility. So basically anything that's emotional and intense sounds to me like it could be a numinous experience. So that's, I think, a, an important connection point of for Karen Armstrong, where the interface between humans and and her the reality of their god exists is when within these types of things that could be called the numinous. And she gives us several other examples of people trying to ex explain this idea or other cultures that have similar ideas. There's not a lot of scholarship behind this, so mm, but um, that's again this the narrative that she's creating. One of the things that Armstrong insists on during the course of this chapter is the idea that people who held these myths were not holding them literally. They didn't actually think this was an accurate record of past events. 
She writes, When people began to develop their myths and worship their gods, they were not seeking to find a literal explanation for natural phenomenon. Sorry, phenomena. The symbolic stories, cave paintings, and carvings were an attempt to express their wonder and to link this, this pervasive mystery with their own lives. Indeed, poets, artists, and musicians often impel, are often impelled by a similar desire today. And she repeats this again, um, another page, these myths were not intended to be taken literally, but they were metaphorical attempts to describe a reality that was too complex and elusive to express in any other way. Indeed, it seems that in the ancient world, people believed that it was only by participating in this divine life that they would become truly human. This, I think, captures the the elevated extent to which Armstrong regards myths and the purpose of myths in a society and into an individual. Uh, and so this obviously is, is quite important to her as she moves through the book and, and he looks at the various ways that people do this. Myths, of course, for Armstrong then are a, a very important point of attempting to connect with and relate to the world, but I guess to not understand it in a scientific way. So I don't want to say too much about that in this video, but it does seem to her that myths and these emotional intensities are the things that uh, she's looking at as driving the evolution or people's relationship with gods. Following this, what Armstrong does is go into Mesopotamian creation myths. The reason why they're important for her story is that the area that was is Mesopotamia it contains um, cultures that would influence what would eventually become the Jewish religion. So from the Mesopotamian religions and myths you see in the influence of into the Canaanite religions and from the Canaanite religions spring Judaism. And she doesn't quite articulate very clearly that that's the path that we're going to be going on to, but that's the path we're going to be going on to. Now I don't want to take up time reinventing the wheel. There are already videos out on YouTube that do a very good review, a much better review than I could do on the subject of Mesopotamian creation myths. I'm going to link two of them in the description box below. One of them is to a Yale old uh, like a religious literature course where it's looking at, I don't like to say the Old Testament um, because it seems to privilege the New Testament, uh, so I prefer to use the term sort of Jewish scriptures more generally to apply to all of the writings, and then if I'm meaning the first five books I'll, I'll talk about like the Pentateuch, but I tend to use the phrases um, Jewish scriptures and Christian scriptures, not Old Testament and New Testament, just for, for people who, who don't know. That course is on the evolution of the Bible and in terms of the Jewish um, religion and its faith and its evolution and development. So please check that out. The other video I'm going to link is by Evidence from his video series, which is focused on the book A History of God. And he does a very nice summary with graphs, and it's really good, really well done, that covers basically the things that you, you're going to find in chapter one. So go ahead and check those out for a, a more expansive uh, and also from the Yale course, a, a more academically grounded review of these creation myths and how we can see the patterns emerge in the Jewish writings. There are a few things I do want to point out in terms of the Mesopotamian myths that will be important as we move on. One is the parallel of the idea of waters and then things coming out of waters. There's uh, also in the Mesopotamian myth when Marduk defeats Tiamat, he cracks, I think, her open her body and uses it to form the, the sky and the earth, which if you know about the firmament in the Genesis story, you can see the parallels there of the idea of, of the dividing the waters and having the waters above and below. In this case, it's the body of a goddess and, um, you know, uh, and the realm of human beings. It's not entirely mapped on, but there, there are similarities enough to, you know, to point them out. The other thing is the creation of human beings come from, in the Mesopotamian creation myth, uh, from a slain god, his blood and the dirt of the ground. And humans uh, were made by God from the blood of this, this dead god and, god and the, the dirt to be workers. I'm pretty sure that the idea was that humans were going to uh, serve the gods and do their work for them. So this is basically you can see some of the parallels but obviously some some really important distinctions there when you compare it to the genesis account 
One of the last thing I want to do is sort of summarize the, the attributes of the gods that we see as Karen has described them in the Mesopotamian stories. And that is they're temporal. They don't exist sort of beyond time and space. The gods are constrained. They fight with each other. They can die. Um, you know, these are, it's obviously not omnipotence. The gods are geographical. The story takes place in, um, for uh, the, that particular area and that particular city and people and they're, they feel a connection to their gods within their geography. We see the characters of gods evolving over time. They have different motivations and they you know, get in fights and things. So again, this sort of not particularly transcendent. Um, they are a personal god in that they're, uh, you know, cre human beings are created and in, we'll see more interaction with these gods in, in the later stories, but it's not a transcendent sort of aloof thing. And perhaps more importantly, there is no moral framework here. There's, I mean, those kind of come later on when we get laws from human beings, but in the creation stories themselves, there doesn't seem to be any hint that the gods are supremely moral, supremely good uh, arbiters of justice, that they have any intention of creating a world that's, you know, centered around human beings and getting human beings to behave in a particular way that these gods think are moral. None of that exists in, in these, these writings. The last thing I want to discuss before I wrap up the video is just to point toward the, the Canaanite religions and the Canaanite gods because you'll see that some of the names are going to come up again in the Jewish writings. The, the main gods that we're going to be dealing with, um, it seems to be, well, in the Canaanite religion there was Yam Nahar, the god of the seas and the rivers. Then there was also Baal, uh, Baal Habad, who was the god of storm and fertility. You had El, who was the Canaanite high god. And you had Asherah, who was El, El's wife and mother of the gods. So the names of Baal, you probably have, you know, if you know a little bit about the Bible, you, you know the name of Baal. El is, again, a commonly used name in the Jewish writings. So we're going to see these ideas, these characters, shall we say, come up again um, and again. In the next video, what I will do is rant a little bit about the first chapter. Um, we'll see how it goes. I don't know that it's going to be so much longer. Uh, it's going to be more, I guess, a geeky thing about presentation style. But I guess if you enjoyed my last rant, watch it. Um, I don't know that you're going to get a whole lot more out of it in terms of my critique, you know, um, because as I said, there are really good academic sources out there on YouTube already that you can go and look at it and investigate these questions a bit deeper yourself. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time um, doing you know, academic cross-referencing and checking on, on everything. But in the next video, we are going to move into the Jewish writings. And I have a bit of a plan for that. You know, this, isn't the, this is the post-rand video, the, the next video about Karen's uh, book. And what I want to do there is to try to make the time period a little bit more connected to our own experiences by um, looking at it in terms of what if we subtracted the years from today, how far back um, would we have to go to see the first uh, writings from J or E? Or when does the priestly source appear in terms of the timeline? And in the next video, I'll explain how I did that and I'll, I'll give a little timeline. And, and I think it uh, will help give you a sense of perspective of actually how much time there is between these waves of literary development in the in the Jewish writings. And so um, I want to point that out a little bit just so you have something to look forward to in the next video because I do do a lot of work preparing for these. Um, and the other thing too is just to let you know also where it's going uh, so you can kind of be prepared when you come by the next time. I would also just like to take just a few seconds to thank everybody who's come over from Steve Shive's channel, who came over after watching his shout out to me, or if you've just found this too, hello, welcome, welcome to A Different Atheist Reads. If you've subscribed, thank you so much. Uh, the views are obviously the most important thing. I want to make sure people can see my videos and are, want to watch my videos. The likes and dislikes I don't really care so much about, but what I do care about are subscribers because a subscriber says to me, it says to me that you are invested enough in this content to keep up with it and follow it. And it is my intention to upload weekly so that you don't have to worry about me disappearing off of YouTube for ages and wondering what the heck happened to that book. Um, so if you are a new subscriber or a subscriber for a while, thank you so much. And if you're new, welcome. I really appreciate your support.
that will wrap it up for this edition. I hope you um, got something out of it, and if again, if you want to do even more into Mesopotamian creation myths, please do check out the links in the description box below. This has been A Different Atheist Reads. Thanks for watching.